You are clear for launch. And with that, shut down your visors. O2 on and prepare for ignition to O2. Copy, copy that and um... Alright, Mr. Rushoff here. So we've just finished going over Southeast Asia. So now what we're going to do is move it a little bit further to the east, to East Asia. And in this lesson, we're going to look at the physical geography of East Asia and how that has impacted the people of the region. First of all, when we say East Asia, we're talking about the last six countries in Asia that we're going to talk about. Those countries are China, which just isn't the largest country in the region, but has also been the major force of the culture in the region. To the central north of China, we find the homeland of the Mongols, Mongolia. Now, to the east of China, we find the Korean Peninsula. And this is where we're going to find North and South Korea. I'll let you kind of figure out which is which. Across the Sea of Japan, which the Koreans called Tonghe, which means the East Sea, we find Japan. This is an archipelago of almost 7,000 islands. Now, speaking of islands, we have the island of Formosa, south of the East China Sea, where we find Taiwan. Now, this is a controversial country as China actually claims the country as part of their own country and not as a separate country on its own. Now, as you can imagine, this is a very delicate situation, which we're going to talk about when we talk about East Asia's modern issues. Now, speaking of the Sea of Japan and the East China Sea, these are two bodies of water that are important for our discussion on East Asia. Now, if those are the bodies of water, you need to know what are the physical features of the region. Well, there are several mountain ranges in East Asia, but here are the ones I want you to know about. In the northwest corner of China, there is the Tian Chain, and then to its south is the Kunlun Chain. Now, south of the Kunlun Chain are the Himalayas, and in between these two mountain ranges is the highest plateau in the world, the Tibetan Plateau. With an average elevation of around 14,000 feet, along with thousands of glaciers, the vegetation of the Tibetan Plateau are grass lands, and we find that the people there developed as being nomadic, much like Central Asians we talked about earlier. But the Tibetan Plateau used to be site of its own country, Tibet, until the Chinese invaded in 1950 and annexed Tibet into the greater China. Now, to the east of the Tibetan Plateau, we find the Qingling Mountains. By the way, can you figure out what the word mountains in Chinese might mean? Yep, it's Shane. Or written in Chinese, it looks like this. And the character kind of looks like a mountain, doesn't it? It's because Chinese is actually a pictograph language we'll talk about in a few lessons. Now, the Taebaek Mountains in South Korea play host to the 2018 Winter Olympics. This mountain range stretches through both North and South Korea, where the mountains actually make up over 70% of both countries. This means that less than 20% of the country's land is actually farmable. On the largest island of Japan, Honshu, we not only find its capital, Tokyo, but we find the Japanese Alps. As you might expect, the Alps is not a Japanese name. It is a name given to the mountains by a British archaeologist around 1880. The Japanese Alps actually describes three mountain ranges, the Akashi, the Kiso, and the Hida Mountains. Now, unlike the Korean Taebaek and Chinese mountains, which were formed by convergent folding, these mountains were formed by convergent subduction because Japan is part of the Ring of Fire. No, 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 not that Ring of Fire. This Ring of Fire. The subduction zone that stretches around the Pacific Ocean and is the home of 90% of all the earthquakes in the world and 75% of the world's volcanoes. And Japan does have volcanoes. In fact, there are 100 active volcanoes in Japan. This NASA satellite photograph shows two volcanoes, the Shinmo Dake and the Sakurajima volcanoes erupting at the same time in 2011. But the most famous Japanese volcano is probably this one, Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji lies just 75 miles away from Tokyo, and I've been told that you can actually see it from the city. However, the three times I've been to Tokyo has always been cloudy, so I've never seen it, although I've been told it's absolutely beautiful. Now, although the last time that Mount Fuji erupted was in 1707, geologists still classify Mount Fuji as an active volcano. That's probably a good idea because after an earthquake in 2011, many feared that the volcano may wake up after its 300-year nap. But in the end, it has continued to snooze on. Now, the impact of these mountains is not only to serve as obstacles that largely isolated East Asia, but through the rain shuttle effect, it has created two major deserts, the Gobi Desert and the Taklamakan Desert. We find the Taklamakan Desert nestled between the Tin Shane Mountains. These are the mountains that actually stretch from Central Asia and the Kunlun Shane Mountains to the south. 
Both of these mountains block precipitation coming into the Taklamaka Desert. Now, the desert features some of the largest sand dunes in the world, rising up to 1,500 feet high. Now, these sand dunes make up 85% of the desert, where its interior is largely devoid of any type of vegetation. This is the reason why, when the area was first inhabited, people settled to the north and the southern portion, as this map depicts of civilization around the 3rd century AD. Now, the Silk Road also made its way around the north and around the south of the desert, as traders did not dare to cross the desert and all of its sandstorms. Now, the Gobi Desert is found in north-central China and stretches into Mongolia. And it perhaps is my favorite desert because it is in the Gobi Desert that some of the most important dinosaur fossils have been found. In fact, Jurassic Park's Olin Velociraptor was found in this desert. And near a rocky outcrop known as the Flaming Cliffs, the first ever dinosaur eggs have actually been found. We've talked about mountains and deserts. What about the rivers? Well, there's many rivers in the region, but I'm going to highlight three. They are the Yellow, the Yangtze, and the Xi rivers. Now, to the very north, we find the last of the four great river civilizations of the world. We've already talked about Mesopotamia, which rose along the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in the Middle East. Ancient Egypt was only possible due to the Nile River, and the Indus River served as the cultural hearth to South Asia. The Yellow River is where civilization in China first flourished. It is actually nicknamed the Mother River of China. While modern humans may have been in China as early as 80,000 years ago, it is along the banks of the Yellow River uh, 10,000 years ago where we find the first settlements which have grown up to be China, what we know as today. Along its shores, we see the multiple examples of the culture that it inspired. You can find the Temple of Taishan where emperors would come to give sacrifice to the gods, and then you can find the over 8,000 soldiers who were to protect the emperor in the afterworld. In between these two sites, you will find where Buddhists would come to worship at low men caves, and on a boat, you actually can sail on the Yellow River right by the Great Wall. But while the Yellow River is nicknamed the Mother River, it has also earned another nickname, China's Sorrow. This river transport far more sediment than any other river its size in the world. This is why we call it the Yellow River. But because it also flowed through relatively flat ground, the sediment would settle to the bottom of the river and then force the river out of its banks, flooding the area. In the last three to 4,000 years, the river has actually flooded 1,500 times. It has actually even completely changed its course 18 times during that period. Now, the floods of 1887 killed as many as 2 million people and is the second most devastating natural disaster in history. These floods were only outdone by the floods of 1931, which some estimates put at 4 million people killed by the floodings of this river. Now, to the south is the Yangtze River. It is the longest river in all of Asia and the third longest river in the world. Settlements beginning around 7,000 years ago combined with the Yellow River civilization to become the cultural hearth of China. Today, the Yangtze River is the major river for trade in China and supports nearly one-third of China's 1.4 billion citizens. Now, unfortunately, the Yangtze River has the same problem with flooding as the Yellow River has. This is one of the reasons why the Three Gorges Dam was built in nine years between 1994 and 2003. As the world's largest dam, it stands at over 600 feet high, and the reservoir extends for 400 miles. In addition to taming the Yangtze River's flood, it provides electric power for the region. It also allows for ships to be able to reach into China's agricultural center. Now, the Three Gorges Dam did come with a price beyond the some $32 billion it cost to build. Some 1,000 villages were flooded, causing anywhere between 1 and 2 million people to have to move. The flooding behind the dam that created the 400-mile-long reservoir not only meant the loss of animal habitat, but several historical and archaeological sites now lay at the bottom of the reservoir. However, this is hardly the first time the Chinese had altered the water transportation in the region. Around 580 AD, the Sui dynasty began to connect canals that had been built over the previous 1,000 years. This now larger canal would be dubbed the Grand Canal. Successive Chinese dynasties would, until 1633, continue to expand the canal that now starts in Beijing, pushes further south, and actually connects both the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers. This was a huge advancement for China because not only did it facilitate trade, but it unified 
China. Now, while not as large as the Yangtze or the Yellow River, the Xi River combines with many other rivers, such as the Pearl River, to become the major river in the southern portion of China, facilitating trade in the region. All right, so those are some of the important physical features of East Asia. Let's talk about East Asia's climate. Now, remember, we've already discussed the role that the mountains and the rain shadow effect is, has in actually impacting the climate in, in China. In Western China, we also start to see the effect of continentality that reduces the amount of rainfall in that area. As you can see, there are multiple different climates in the Tibetan Plateau based upon the elevation of the area. But we must remember that latitude is the major driver of climate. Interestingly, China is about at the same latitude as the United States, so the east coast of China has a very similar climate as we have on our own east coast. Now, areas in eastern China up to about 35 degrees latitude largely have a humid subtropical climate like we have here in Texas. Now, north of that 35 degrees latitude, we find a humid continental climate. We see the same effects of latitude and the climates in Korea and Japan. Humid subtropical climates are found south of 35 degrees latitude, and humid continental north of 35 degrees latitude. Now, just as we've seen around the world, a region's climate can create extreme weather. And the extreme climate we find in East Asia is typhoons. Now, they start out in the Pacific Ocean and move westward towards the Asian mainland, just like we find as hurricanes in the United States. In fact, typhoons are pretty much the same thing as hurricanes or cyclones for that matter. The only real difference between the three storms are where they occur. In the Northwest Pacific, they are called typhoons. The tropical storms in the Northern Atlantic and Northeastern Pacific are called hurricanes. And in the Southern Oceans of the Indian Pacific and Atlantic, the same storms go by the name cyclones. And there you go. At this point, you should be able to identify the, some of the most important physical features of East Asia. You should be able to look at how some of the people of the region have adapted to their environment. And then we should be able to describe the climate of the region. In our next lesson, we'll begin by looking at the origins of the culture of the region. Until then, keep on learning. <music>